Welcome to the applications of diagnostic exome sequencing among patients in the neonatal intensive care unit. Today's event will address the growing use of diagnostic exome sequencing in the NICU setting and how this test can be a powerful tool in the diagnostic process for the neonatal patient population. Our first speaker today is Layla Shamarzadi. Layla is a genetic counselor here at Ambry and is also a supervisor for our clinical genomics team. Layla graduated from the Stanford University School of Medicine Genetic Counseling Program and previously worked as a genetic counselor assistant at the Cancer Risk Program at UCSF and as a DNA technician at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. She also earned a second master's degree in biotechnology from Johns Hopkins University. Layla has a strong interest in new technologies including next generation sequencing and will be sharing retrospective institutional data with you today. Our second speaker is Tahila Ness. Tahila is a new member of the Ambry Genetics team and currently serves as a pediatric genetic specialist. Prior to joining Ambry, Tahila practiced clinically as a neonatal nurse practitioner and has over 10 years of nursing experience in the NICU. She received her master's degree in nursing from the University of California, San Francisco, and is an active member of the Association of Neonatal Nurses. Tehila has experienced firsthand the tragic implications of undiagnosed diseases in the neonatal setting, and as you will see today, she's very passionate about improving the diagnostic process for this fragile population. We also have a Q&A section that will be held at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box that's at the right-hand side of your screen. Um, this is a CEU event that has been approved by the NSGC. So please complete the entire survey monkey that will automatically pop up at the end of your, of your webinar when you log out. This will be the only way we can claim CEUs for your attendance. At this time, I will turn it over to Layla Shamarzadi to begin our presentation. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about exome sequencing applications in the NICU and to share some of our data with you. Um, just to start with some disclosures, Tahila and I are both full-time employees at Ambry Genetics. Um, this presentation is, however, unbiased, um, but our knowledge of exome sequencing is based mainly what we, on what we do here at Ambry. All right, um, we have three main objectives for our talk today. Um, first, we'd like to report the retrospective data relating to the use of exome sequencing in the neonatal patient population. And then we're going to evaluate the benefits of exome sequencing for the neonatal patients and really its emerging role in NICU clinical care. And then finally, we're going to discuss the use of exome sequencing in the clinical setting and really show how this technology can have a positive implication on the clinical and psychosocial aspects of patient care. All right, just to give a little background, um, diagnostic exome sequencing um, which is, you know, often referred to as whole exome sequencing. I like to use the term diagnostic exome sequencing since it is um, a, a method that we're trying to perform a di find a diagnosis for a patient as opposed to other uses of whole exome sequencing in research settings. So diagnostic exome sequencing is a complex genetic test that involves the sequencing and analysis of roughly 20,000 genes in the genome. This may also include sequencing and screening for characterized mutations in the mitochondrial genome. So this can vary by lab whether the mitochondrial genome is included. So what is the exome? Um, as many of us are aware, um, the exome is the protein coding part of the genome. So the human genome contains roughly about 20,000 genes. These genes um, are made up of mainly introns and exons. Um, and exome sequencing is really sequencing all of those exons at one time. So when you're looking at the whole genome, you can see that sequencing of the exome can be a more time and cost effective method than sequencing of the entire genome. Um, as you see here on the right, the exons contain, um, make up about 1% of the entire genome, while the introns make up about the rest of the 99% of the entire genome. Uh, what's interesting is that most of the mutations that we know of today that lead to inherited disease are actually located within the exome. So about 85% of the mutations that we are aware of today are um, located within the exons, while only about 15% are located in the introns or other intervening sequences. 
Um, therefore, when, when comparing whole exon sequencing to whole genome sequencing, um, you see that exon sequencing is about one-fifth, or could be one-fifth to roughly about one-twentieth of the price of whole genome sequencing. So this can be a really clinically effective tool um, for the use of, um, for diagnosing patients. Um, so I'd like to start with um, discussing a little bit about our institutional experience with um, diagnostic exome sequencing. And um, we've, over the last few years, we've really found that this, um, this method of molecular testing has been instrumental in providing a molecular diagnosis in patients that have previously undiagnosed Mendelian disease. And so we performed a retrospective study to observe the application of exome sequencing in a number of different parameters. And we found that some of our highest detection rate were among the neonatal, our highest detection rates were among the neonatal patients. And so we wanted to present some of these findings um, on this application of this testing on the neonatal population today. And then during the second half of the talk, Tahila is going to go more in depth about um, the implications for these patients and these families. All right. So I'm just um, starting with putting this slide up there. Um, this is our, our institution's offerings for um, diagnostic exome sequencing. And this is just to get a sense of the cost and the turnaround time from one laboratory, although this can all vary from laboratory to laboratory. Um, so at our institution, the turnaround time for um, an exome test is 8 to 12 weeks. There is a, a more rapid option, which is 2 to 5 weeks, which could be um, much uh, very helpful in a NICU setting. Um, and then the price ranges from 5800 or um, to about 15000 um, depending on which test is ordered. But I'd like to draw your attention to the left-hand side of the column here, um, where these are um, different parameters or different um, test options that we have that are included in our test. And these are things that can vary from laboratory to laboratory. And we often, um, you know, I often tell clinicians to consider some of these um, things when deciding which laboratory to um, order an exon test from as, um, and see which one would best fit their needs and the patient's needs. So these are things that you could always consider when looking at um, exon sequencing offerings. So in analyzing um, uh, exon sequencing results, you're seeing um, alterations in both characterized genes and novel genes. And so just to define each of these, characterized genes are genes that have been previously associated with human disease um, based on HGMD or OMEN mor morbid databases or even um, new medical literature that has been published. There are roughly about 4,000 characterized genes um, in the human genome, although this number is rapidly increasing. Um, novel genes are genes that have not yet been associated with Mendelian disease, and they make up about 16,000 um, genes of the human genome. And basically, they're novel. They're not yet characterized. And so we may need to look at other types of information to help us determine if these genes are relating to the patient's symptoms, such as animal models or functional studies. So understanding the function of the gene really comes into play when performing analysis in, when we're reporting exome cases. What makes exome sequencing different than some of the other molecular tests is that there are really two important parameters to consider when trying to determine whether an identified alteration is causing the patient's symptoms or not. So first, we take a look at the gene to determine whether the clinical presentation of the patient um, is associated with this with overlap of the, with um, the patient's symptoms or not. And then we take a look at the alteration, just like any other molecular test and determine whether it has a pathogenic effect on the gene. So both of these factors work together to help us determine if and how each of these alterations should be reported. And then just like any other molecular test, you will have you know, positive results, negative results, uncertain results. Um, but we often ca um, categorize our results on whether the gene is characterized or novel, and those types of results may differ. For example, with novel genes, you may have a likely positive or possibly positive result, while with characterized genes, the results can be more straightforward, positive, negative, uncertain, likely positive. So 
So I hope that helped with getting a sense of how the analysis is performed and how things are reported in exome sequencing. So now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and just dive right into the data. So what we did was we performed a retrospective analysis on our first 500 patients submitted for diagnostic exome sequencing at our institution. And we took a look at three main things. First, we did an analysis of the patient population. Who were these patients and how old were they? And then we took a look at um, the most common indications for testing among our total cohort, but also among the neonatal cohort. And then we um, took a look at the detection rates among these groups. So the first thing we did, as I mentioned, was analyzing the patient population. And um, out of the 500 patients that we uh, did sequencing on, we found that the majority of patients submitted were from a pediatric population. And this is pretty consistent across you know, all literature that we've seen as well. Um, so about 78% of our patients were pediatric, 16% were adults, and 6%, or 28 out of the 500, were patients from the neonatal realm. Two of these 28 patients included cases of fetal demise. And in this study, we um, define neonatal as patients presenting with symptoms prenatally or within the first four weeks of life and were submitted for exome sequencing at four months of age or less. The next thing we looked at were the indications for testing. So we wanted to see, first of all, what were the most common indications overall among all of the 500 patients? And then what were the most common indications among the neonatal patients? And so the first thing we identified were that neurologic findings were um, the most common indication for testing among the first 500 patients. So that made up 65% of the, the indications for testing among those patients. And then among the neonatal patients, musculoskeletal findings were among the most common indication for testing. And maybe if these neonatal patients um, were a little bit older, some neurologic findings would be found as well, oftentimes in that neonatal realm um, some of these neurologic phenotypes may not be fully distinguishable. And this is just a, a plot of um, the top nine indications for testing, specifically among the neonatal patients. And the gray columns here you can see are the neonatal patients, while the blue are, uh, are overall patients. And um, here on the left you can see musculoskeletal, um, were among, were, was the highest indication for testing among the neonates, while when you were looking at the overall patients, neurologic findings were actually the highest. However, you can see a variety of different indications for testing. So there wasn't, you know, just one strong indication. Um, you see a variety of different things from craniofacial findings, ophthalmologic, renal, GI, pulmonary, cardiovascular, and metabolic. So we did have a pretty uh, wide range of, of indications. All right, and then the final thing we looked at were the detection rates. So we were very interested to see um, how the detection rates of the neonatal patients compared overall to the detection rates. So what was very interesting was that the, our neonatal cases had a higher detection rate than overall patients. So our overall detection rate here on the right uh, was 37%. So there was a positive or likely positive result in 37% of our 500 cases. While in the neonatal cases, the 28 patients, uh, we had a 50% positive or likely positive detection rate. I'll go through each of these. Um, so this is just a, uh, a graph of our overall detection rate of our 500 cases. And we can see here that um, overall we had a 37% detection rate. And this included 30% um, that were positive or likely positive in a characterized gene, and 7% that were positive or likely positive in a novel gene. And then about 9% overall were uncertain, and then we had about 54% negative. When looking at the neonatal detection rates, 
um, we found that 50% were positive or likely positive. 43% of those were actually de novo findings um, in the proban only. 14% were uncertain, and 36% were negative. Among the positive cases, 43% uh, were characterized, and 7% were uh, found in novel genes. And this is just a, um, a table with some of our selected diagnoses. These are uh, most of our positive findings. And you can see here we had a variety of different, um, different results. Uh, we had two novel gene findings here. One of the cases actually had um, two novel genes, so it was like a dual diagnosis. And um, for those who tuned into our webinar a couple weeks ago, we also had um, a recurrent case, ACTG2, which we identified two different times in two different patients presenting very similarly in the neonatal period, and they were both diagnosed with visceral myopathy. So you can see the range of diagnoses. And so um, to conclude some of our data, we um, first of all found that neonatal patients had 35% higher detection rates when compared to all patients undergoing diagnostic axon sequencing. So this really shows um, that we had increased detection of Mendelian disease among neonates. And although this you know, may be likely correlating with the congenital or early onset severe phenotype that you see early on prenatally um, compared to maybe some of the more milder phenotypes that take longer to, to identify, um, but you know, this was definitely a very strong uh, point that we wanted to share. And then the other thing we found is that, you know, diagnostic axon sequencing can really be a powerful diagnostic tool, particularly during the neonatal period. You know, it provides earlier diagnosis, can reduce unnecessary treatments and testing, and can really guide clinical management during this critical period. Um, and Tahila is going to touch a lot more on the second point um, during the second half of the talk. And so I'd like to present just a couple cases um, to, uh, to illustrate some of these findings that we have found. The first example um, I'd like to present was a one-month-old female. She was born at 38 weeks gestation. Um, her prenatal history included oligohydramnios and bright areas in the renal cortices. Um, when she was born, her clinical history um, confirmed some of these findings. She did have bilateral renal cysts and they were detected on ultrasound and based on um, also elevated creatinine levels. Um, her past test history, she had no genetic testing, but she did have you know, the renal ultrasound and um, the elevated creatinine. Um, her family history included a, an older sister who died from complications of renal cystic dysplasia. She had hepatic fibrosis, hyperbilirubinemia, jaundice, and cardiomyopathy. She also presented with oligohydramnios prenatally, and that's actually what prompted um, taking a closer look at this uh, patient prenatally as well. Um, the sister had PKHD1 gene sequencing, which was negative. So they were trying to look for other causes, um, other recessive causes of this renal disease. And as in bold, you can see the um, areas of overlap between um, the sister and um, the proband. So this is the family history. Um, as you can see, the older sister was deceased. And so we did sequencing and co-segregation analysis on this family. And we had a positive result. Um, we found compound heterozygous mutations in the NPHP3 gene. Um, and this was related, this was, um, we found uh, two mutations. The first one was a missense. Um, and the alteration was interpreted as likely deleterious. And the second alteration was a deletion, which resulted in a frame shift mutation, um, which was interpreted as a deleterious mutation. Um, the gene overlap was very good with um, the patient's symptoms. And we found that both um, the parents also carried, each carried one of these alterations. And um, we were able to diagnose the patient with a molecular diagnosis of NPHP3-related nephronopsis syndrome. Um, this is just some of the um, features of the syndrome that 
um, some of the symptoms that we did see in this patient. I didn't list all of the features of the syndrome, but um, basically it's an autosomal recessive cystic kidney disease. Um, it can present um, in, in, during the infantile period, juvenile, and it also has adolescent forms. Um, there's also a lethal neonatal nephronopsis um, form that has been reported. Um, prenatal presentation included oligohydramnios and hyperechogenic kidneys, um, just as we saw with both of these patients. And there have been other extra renal features also reported, such as hepatic fibrosis, cardiac involvement, like we saw in the sister, and retinitis pigmentosa. Now for the second case example, um, this was uh, a male proband who um, had a lot of things going on. Um, his prenatal history included omphalocele, bilateral cleft lip and palate. Um, he had sub subarachnoid cysts, which actually resolved, actually resolved microphthalmia, um, and abnormal tissues were identified on the palms of his hands. Um, these were all identified prenatally. And then when he was born, a lot, all these findings were confirmed um, at birth, but he also had additional things in his clinical history. He had just multiple congenital anomalies, including macrocephaly, facial, dys facial dysmorphology. He also had flat orbits. Um, his ears were posteriorly rotated and low set. Um, he had right-sided postaxial polydactyly of the hand and foot. He also had mild 2, 3, 4 syndactyly. Um, and this patient actually was deceased at two months old. Um, his past test history, you know, was normal for um, a lot of the, the common things that you can test for. He had a normal ma male karyotype, microarray was normal, cardiac echo was normal, renal ultrasound, showed mild hydronephrosis. Um, he had a normal metabolic workup, and they tested for BMP4 gene sequencing, which was normal. This was actually done in a lab in Europe. Um, and then um, the mother became um, pregnant again, and um, uh, so this we used this um, proband, uh, the original child as the main proband, and then another brother was born. He was also identified prenatally with similar features, and um, both were um, samples from both patients were submitted for testing along with the parents. And um, you can see down here we had two brothers um, similarly affected and parents that were all submitted um, for exome sequencing and co-segregation analysis. And we found a positive result. Um, we found a mutation in the OFD1 gene. Um, this was, um, found, the patient was found to be hemizygous for this mutation. The alteration was interpreted as likely deleterious and the overlap was very good with the patient's symptoms. And um, this patient was given a, diagnose, a molecular diagnosis of oral facial digital syndrome 1. And um, we were able to see that both the proband and the brother um, were hemizygous for this mutation, and the mother was heterozygous for this mutation. And we actually used the older brother who um, was deceased as the proband, um, mainly because um, he was older and presented with more symptoms um, during a longer period of time than the newborn brother that we use. Um, so we can often use um, either, either patient um, for, as a proband in these types of cases. We usually like to use an older one if they're similarly affected. And so that concludes um, the case examples, and we're going to shift gears a little bit to Tahila now. Thank you, Layla. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for listening in today. Um, so just to give you a little background on my experience, as Stephanie mentioned, I've been working in the NICU for the last 10 or so years. Um, first, I was a nurse at the bedside, and then I was a nurse practitioner. So I've been lucky enough to see it from many angles, um, and that's really given me the ability to assess the multiple needs of this population um, from various angles. So. We're going to talk about the NICU. So what makes up this neonatal population? So most of you know there are many premature infants that get admitted to the NICU all the time. Um, but there are also many term infants who get admitted to the NICU. And these infants are usually admitted for the possibility of infection, low blood sugar, respiratory distress, or let's say even jaundice. Um, 
So we're going to be discussing the infants who are admitted for having questionable diagnoses um, and need enough intervention to have made it to the NICU for further evaluation and support. And these can be term or preterm infants. So I think this statement is pretty shocking. Nearly 50% of children in pediatric genetics clinics do not have a definitive diagnosis, which is a huge problem for obvious reasons, but really because it makes it very hard to make informed decisions regarding clinical management, and it doesn't provide any ability to provide counseling for future pregnancies. So having an established diagnosis helps us determine the inheritance pattern, it guides the clinical management, and it helps us appropriately counsel for those future pregnancies. So this is a policy statement from the ACMG. Um, expressing the value of diagnostic exome sequencing in the clinical setting and how it can help provide an explanation of the patient's phenotype. So the rest of this policy actually goes on to discuss how the continued research and the technological advancements surrounding diagnostic exome sequencing will help contribute to clinical care. So ultimately what they're saying is that the more we utilize this test, the more information we're going to get, which hopefully will help everyone feel a little less hesitant when ordering it. So when do, would you consider diagnostic exome sequencing? So the, the first bullet point here shows, obviously, previous genetic testing has not identified any genetic explanation. So you've done multiple tests, and all of them have come back negative. The next one um, really is when the presentation is unclear and you aren't sure which specific genes to target for testing. And the third one, the presentation of the patient does not look like anything anyone has seen before, and you suspect it may be a novel gene. And finally, the last one, what it really says is that when targeted gen genetic testing is not available for this specific condition. So even if you know what it is, but you can't test for it, um, exome sequencing would be an available option. So I think this is going to be really what I hone in on for you guys because the benefits of exome sequencing and early diagnosis in this population is really beneficial. So number one, so exome has the potential to establish a diagnosis. So how much does this benefit this particular population besides just providing families with answers? Um, so I think as most of you know, a definitive diagnosis helps, in, um, helps establish an inheritance pattern and helps with pre-symptomatic screening, carrier testing, and future pregnancies. How do we guide clinical management? With any patient, I think, and for this population of patients specifically, understanding the underlying etiology of a symptom or disease helps target treatment and it increases the chances for alleviating and hopefully eliminating the symptom or the disease. So I'm going to use an example, actually. Um, you guys all know the show House. So the patient comes in, they have multiple symptoms, and they spend, really, the entire show attempting to figure out what the issue is. They try different treatment strategies, and the patient, in the meantime, is becoming worse and worse. So it's only when Dr. House figures out what the underlying issue is that they can treat the patient and that hopefully they live. So really, this is the same principle in the NICU. When we're faced with multiple symptoms and none of those symptoms have an underlying etiology, it's very difficult to treat them. When a diagnos diagnosis points us in the right direction, it helps make the medical management a lot more clear. And this way we can tailor our intervention so that we can give the right medication, we can involve the right specialist, and really we can help improve the quality of life from very early on. So eliminating the extras. Like I said, we're eliminating extra testing, extra evaluations, and we're really also eliminating as much anxiety and fear as possible for the family. So by doing this, we help gain the family's trust. We help gain their confidence um, as they watch us day in and day out take care of their child. When we're constantly testing but not coming back with results, it's really confusing for the families, and they start to really question our ability as providers. And I'm sure you guys have been in that situation. It's not a good situation to be in. And obviously, we want to provide answers. We went into this profession to help people. So 
let's say even though every other hospital would be providing the same care in the exact same manner, doing multiple tests, trying different medications, because that's what medicine is. And unfortunately, we don't always have those answers right away. When the trust is gone, it's really hard to gain it back. And it makes that extremely difficult to provide guidance and give support. So there's many times in the NICU that we help families make the decision to either withdraw or continue life support. And there's a lot of factors that go into this process, obviously. Um, so from the family, really, their personal observation of the suffering that's going on with their child, their perceptions of their child's will to survive, because that actually differs with each family, and sometimes it's very hard for them to see what's really going on, um, as well as protect and advocate for their child. So they're very helpless in these situations, um, and they would like to extend any kind of control that they can, understandably so. So they're always expressing the desire to do what's best for their child, but you know there's a lot of struggling. They have guilt. Um, they have feelings of selfishness. And actually, they even try to avoid their own agony and their own sorrow. So actually, there's been multiple studies that show um, how physician recommendations, how we review the options, um, and joint formulation of a plan that helps parents gain a sense of control over their situation. So with all that trust and with all that confidence, you can see how this decision-making process would really be very difficult. So when we have the ability to provide an answer, then we really just want to take that route because we need to give answers quickly and efficiently, things that are going to help parents make decisions on a very quick basis. So, so these are um, a few of the other considerations that I want to go over when you're choosing testing. So there are a lot of emotional aspects that go into care, physical, psychosocial, and lastly, I will touch on cost. So these considerations are really right now talking about the infant, and I'll talk about the family as well. So there's endless testing. There's multiple painful procedures. Um, there's a lot of anger and stress and depression amongst the family um, and limited bonding. So, so truly sick infants with continued symptoms can stay in the NICU for probably about six months and even more. And although the environment that helps heal them, it really also helps hurt them. So what am I talking about? So the NICU is extremely busy and very noisy. Um, if any of you have ever been there, I'm sure you've recognized that. So between the families, the staff, the constant alarming monitors, and all those overhead speakers that yell emergencies, it's a really loud place for infants to be. And actually, many studies have been done um, that validate the detrimental effect noise has on its population. And although every attempt um, in different hospitals is made to decrease all the noise, it's really a difficult external factor to control. So constant touch. So the more critically ill you are, as backwards as this sounds, the more people have to intervene and continually assess how you're doing. So for premature infants, many hospitals have a policy that actually only allow you to do hands-on care every six hours, unless obviously it's medically necessary. Because there are many assessments that need to be done by different people. So for example, if nursing is doing their assessment in the morning and they wrap up the baby and they put the baby back and the baby falls asleep, then 10 minutes later surgery comes by to do their assessment. And then 20 minutes later the physical therapist comes in to do their assessment. We're looking at a lot of hands-on and not a lot of resting. And some of these things need to be done, but other things need to be limited. Um, so eating, pain, and bonding. So eating really is an emotional consideration because being hungry can actually be painful. Um, and it's been shown to prove that psychologically when you are eating, you do better. And it happens to be for babies that that's something that provides comfort. So that's why we give them a pacifier. But you can tell the difference between when they're eating and obviously when they're just having a pacifier, it's not working out for them. So painful procedures, which I'm going to touch more on in one minute and then bonding. So properly bonding with your parent um, can influence the developing brain, which can really in turn affect future interactions with others. Um, it affects your self-esteem, 
self-control, and the ability to achieve optimum mental and physical health. So these continued disruptions, although most of them are medically necessary, continue to interfere with their ability to sleep, their ability to heal, and their ability to grow. So although we may not really be able to change most of these fast factors, I think the faster that we can get them home, the better off they are because we're able to limit them. So endless testing and procedures. There are multiple procedures that go on, CAT scans, MRIs, many IV sticks, the possibility of many intubations, um, chest tubes, blood work, and obviously blood transfusion. So those are a few. So I'm going to go into detail about two procedures because I want to give you a better picture of what they entail. So let's say CT and MRI. Those sound relatively uncomplicated and non-invasive. You go down, you go in the MRI machine, you go back up. But having one of these tests when you're in the NICU can involve actually a lot. So let's take MRI. So we have a very fairly sick child who's intubated on a ventilator, and he or she needs an MRI. So in order to get the baby to MRI, what's going to happen? So the first thing that has to be done is to change all of the IV tubing and medication pumps to MRI-compatible ones. Why they don't make them compatible in the first place is a good question, but they don't, so they all have to be changed. And depending on how sick the infant is, obviously depends on how many tubes and medication lines you have going. So this can take a while, depending on all that stuff. So then there's a few people that need to help out here. So you have to transport the baby in a transport isolate, which means moving the baby from the bed they're currently in. So this is one person to hold all the tubing, one person to disconnect the baby from the current ventilator and hold the endotracheal tube in place, one to actually move the baby, and someone else on standby in case, obviously, you need an extra hand. So now with the baby safely in the transport isolate, they're handbagged to provide manual ventilation all the way down to MRI. I say all the way down because in my head I'm thinking how far that can be sometimes. They get swaddled and they get placed in the MRI machine. So they either get hooked up to a standard ventilator down in MRI or sometimes someone actually handbags the baby until the procedure is over, which on a good day, if they're not moving, takes about 45 minutes, I think. So when the procedure is done, this process all has to be repeated but in reverse once the baby gets back to the unit. So that was just one MRI. I'm going to move on to something a little more familiar for you guys, which is blood work. Um, I'm sure you've all been a part of asking for a certain amount of blood for certain testing, and maybe you've even taken part in obtaining it. I know some geneticists do draw their own blood. Um, so as you're aware, a sick infant in the ICU requires multiple blood draws a day to evaluate labs. They're constantly getting stuck for IVs that blow extremely easily because they move around a lot, obviously, they're babies. Um, and now most of these labs are done through a heel stick. Um, since usually they don't need more than about a half a cc for a lot of the testing. But most genetic testing requires at least five cc's of blood and sometimes even more. So when we get blood drawn, the phlebotomist normally uses a vein. But for an infant, you can't actually obtain that amount of blood from a vein. So we have to do an arterial blood draw. Usually we use the radial artery. Sometimes we have to do it in the foot, but we'll, we'll use the arm for now. So one person has to hold the baby, um, and the other person's going to get the blood. So for a second, I want you to look down at your own wrist and feel your pulse, because you can feel it, but hopefully you cannot see it. So what this is called is called a blind stick, and it uses landmarks and feeling for a pulse every so often. So a lot of us have gotten really good at this technique, and we usually can get it on the first attempt. But sometimes, especially when infants are sick and they've been needing a lot of blood work, this is a really difficult task and take, can take multiple attempts. So this is for one test. One genetic test requires all this just to get blood. So I think the point here is really, it's not to avoid what needs to be done. It's not to scare anyone from not doing anything. It's really to be conscious of what these procedures entail and how we can minimize them, how we can group them together, how we can really work collaboratively to help these babies. So there are a lot of emotional and obviously a lot of physical considerations. Um, there's a lot of stress that families go through. So when families are there, they're there day in, they're there day out. They witness all the things that I just talked about. 
and actually they very kindly let us do our job while probably wanting to tackle us and save their baby. So these parents are very emotional at this time. The mothers have just given birth. Um, they have a constant fluctuation of hormones along with the inability to not properly bond with their infant, um, which really leads to a lot of postpartum depression, a lot of guilt, and a lot of self-blame. Then you have the fathers, um, and they're attempting to hold the whole thing together while I'm sure they're going through a major emotional roller coaster themselves. And I know that everyone who's listening has probably been through this. This is what you guys do too. You help families during extremely emotionally challenging times, and you know what it means to them when you have answers and when you can provide guidance during these stressful situations. So these are a lot of things that go on in the NICU. Um, we have to really make sure that these parents are getting everything they deserve and that we're really figuring out what we can do to help them. So by considering the family dynamic, are they a single parent? Are they in an abusive relationship? You kind of have to act like a social worker, which I'm sure all of you do as well. Um, who wanted or didn't want this pregnancy, and who's blaming one another or are they arguing? Do they have a support system? Do they have parents or siblings or any extended family? Um, can they sleep nearby? Do they have money to park? I mean, all these small things make up what these families are going through and kind of what you have to consider when you're keeping a baby in the NICU for an extended period of time. So I know all of you want to talk about cost. Um, it's usually a very impacting factor. Um, so I think I want to give you enough information to go with. And please ask questions at the end um, if you need to know more. So 65 to 70 percent of NICU admissions typically have an average length of stay of about 20 days. And that's really talking about um, a relatively healthy infant. So we're looking around. $70,000 for a standard admission. The not-so-standard admission probably requires months of hospitalization and additional procedures, which means that if we're looking at about a three-month stay, it's probably, what, around $300,000. And the data I got for this, it really it discussed premature infants because that's really most of the data that we have. It's very hard to find data on genetics and what we're talking about. But it also discussed infants that were admitted from 34 to 37 weeks. And these are just slightly preterm infants. So I'm going to group in infants who just require increased care due to a genetic condition or other similar complications. Because at 34, 35 weeks, they are able to go to the well baby nursery. So if you're 37 weeks, you probably have other things going on. And down here it says payments for NICU admission. Um, for a length of stay greater than four days, typically will be $40,000 to $80,000 in a commercial health plan. So what is the cost of exome in relation to other testing? So a single gene test can range from about four to $500 per test, and panels, as you guys know, can cost upwards of about $1,000. So ordering a single gene test or even a panel can seem pretty appealing. But when you have to order multiple single gene tests or even one or two panels while adding the other essential testing that obviously needs to be done, the bills can add up pretty quickly. So when we're talking about the cost of testing, we're really not just talking about how much a single test will cost. We're really talking about many other crucial factors that need to be considered when we're making this decision. So staying in the NICU for an extended period of time while continuing to attempt treatment strategies while doing diagnostic testing um, can be pretty expensive. So I think that really what I want to point out is that all of these factors really influence our decisions in the NICU. Um, and I wanted to give you guys a little piece of what we're thinking of when we're trying to get or trying to establish a diagnosis quickly. So I hope that helps. Um, and I hope that helped paint a little bit bigger of a picture for you. And now I'm going to pass it back over to Layla. Thank you, Tahila. Um, OK, so all right. 
So, so now we've discussed the psychosocial implications and cost considerations when um, considering exon sequencing. And I'd like to now briefly walk through how to navigate the different test options and when to consider diagnostic exon sequencing. So we've put together this flow diagram that can um, help kind of guide between the different test options. This isn't like an end-all, be-all, but it can um, help in some of the guidance when try to make these decisions. So at the top, let's say we're starting with a patient that's presenting in the NICU. And this, this patient has, you know, a clear clinical diagnosis. Um, we can go um, down this left side of the column here, or left side of the slide. And the first thing often that you can do is consider a single gene test or gene panel. And with results from these, they can be positive and, you know, provide a molecular diagnosis right there. Or the result can be negative. And at that point, you may need to consider, you know, making sure, you know, deletions and duplications were done, and then considering diagnostic exome sequencing would be a good time for this. Um, another time, uh, additionally, if you have a clear clinical diagnosis, um, sometimes considering exome sequencing straight off the bat may be um, a, a good option, specifically if there is a time-sensitive decision that needs to be made, in which case doing a, a rapid option for the exome sequencing with a two to five week turnaround time can really be beneficial. Um, and this is a turnaround time, the turnaround time is something that should definitely be considered. Um, or sometimes there may, may be a clear clinical diagnosis um, however, it may involve several different types of genes in the differential. And at that point, um, X going straight to exome sequencing may even be a more time or cost-effective method of testing. So let's then go back up to the patient that's presenting in the NICU and imagine that they have an unclear clinical diagnosis. Um, so depending on the symptoms, you may want to begin with diagnostic exome sequencing or consider a microarray option in conjunction with exome sequencing or in a reflexive manner, um, both of which are often available at, um, most, at, at many laboratories. And say you're going um, in the microarray route and you have a positive result, you have your molecular diagnosis. But when microarray is negative, um, that's often when uh, we have received a lot of cases that have considered exome sequencing, and exome sequencing may be a good test option at that point. Um, additionally, if you're going straight from an unclear diagnosis to exome sequencing, um, you know, you may get a positive result right there and you have your diagnosis. Um, however, if the results are negative, at that point you've really ruled out the majority of genetic causes um, if you've also done the microarray in conjunction. And sometimes other genetic um, etiology or other etiologies for the condition may need to be considered. Other test options may need to be considered. Or maybe um, there's just something going on and we just don't know enough about the genome yet. And um, at our institution, we offer reanalysis in the future. So taking a look back at the data in a few years may also be an option if the results have been negative um, and trying to see if anything has changed um, in the future. Um, so I hope this kind of has helped um, guide some of those test options and and deciding when to order exome sequencing as opposed to um, other types of tests. All right, and just to close with some take-home points, um, um, based, on this, based on this presentation, we've seen how diagnostic exome sequencing may reduce the costs of unnecessary or repetitive testing. Um, it's really been shown to establish a molecular diagnosis for patients in whom traditional testing methods have been uninformative. It can really accelerate the clinical diagnostic process and uh, reduce, you know, unnecessary testing like I mentioned in the first point. Um, and it can really relieve the emotion and psychosocial strain on family members and patients as Tahila um, went in great detail with. And finally, um, we're able to perform novel gene discovery. You know, a lot of these as you can see, we do have positive cases in novel genes, and with each of these exome cases that we find, um, we have the potential to discover and characterize new genes every day. Um, so it's really helping the genetics community as a whole. 
And I'd just like to um, acknowledge all of the families who really struggle each day with this diagnostic odyssey process. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Donald Basil um, for providing case report and also the Ambry Genetics Clinical Genomics team. Um, thank you everyone for listening and please feel free to email us with any questions as they come up. We're happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have, if not um, during the webinar, but at any future time. Thank you, Layla and Tehila. Um, we do have some questions that came into the Q&A box. Um, the first question was, is there any data on whether or not the results of exome sequencing in the NICU were available in a timely manner to impact treatment? Layla, do you want to answer that one? Uh, sure, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, this is a this is a really huge area to explore. You know, we've been doing exome sequencing for years now, and really what has been the impact besides just a molecular diagnosis? How is this changing treatment for patients? And um, I think, um, you know, there was actually a very recent paper that came out by the group at Kennedy Krieger, and um, they, they reported that the impact, um, uh, they took a look at like 32 patients, and they showed that it can really be, um, beneficial in these patients. They reported um, they had one cohort of the patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, and 30% of those patients had positive results. And of those, 10% of the cases resulted in tangible, significantly altered um, patient management. Um, so, you know, this is just a small cohort, and I think there's going to be more and more data um, as we are, are moving more into this realm. Um, but that's just one piece of data that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, additionally, you know, um, for our specific institution, we have turnaround times for XM Next now that are two to five weeks, um, which can really reduce the wait time for a patient to find a diagnosis, and this can really help with guiding management um, in, when they get their results back within that short time frame. Thank you. Um, Tehila, looking ahead, do you think exome sequencing will be offered more frequently to patients in the NICU setting as it becomes more accepted in the general pediatric setting as a diagnostic tool? I do, actually, yes. So I think in the past, um, because it was so new, we really didn't see a lot of it. But I think as people start recognizing what the benefits are, how it can help reduce length of stay, cost to the hospital, and how it can provide targeted treatment, but I think it will be ordered much more frequently in the future. Thank you. Um, another one, let's see. Uh, this might be good for Layla. What do you think is the role of genetics, or sorry, role of genetic counselors in exome sequencing in the NICU? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I really see this as two bold, I'd say. Um, one is really, you know, to provide informed consent and counseling in the NICU for patients and their families um, so they really understand the types of results they may receive and understand the types of testing that it is. Um, and the other part is really, um, for the clinicians, is, is really genetic counselors can play an important role in educating clinicians, um, whether it's, you know, nurses or uh, physicians or other genetic counselors. Um, about the implications of this testing for their patients and, and any other patient that they may come across and how this may be um, one of the test options that they can consider. Thank you. Um, to, uh, Layla, how, how does billing work um, for when you have a, a patient who's deceased? and? There was a question, how can you bill for testing on the older brother as insurance doesn't pay for testing on deceased individuals? That's a good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, about the specifics, but I think there's a certain time frame after a patient is deceased that they can still be covered under insurance. Um, I'm not sure if it's 30 days or 60 days or something to that effect for that testing. Um, but we also can use the mother as the proband in some cases, and so it could kind of depend on your insurance, and I think um, 
talking with our billing department or the billing department of any um, laboratory that you may be using, they may um, be able to help you guide your um, options and, and who to best use. In any of the cases that were um, sent to Ambry, actually, for uh, neonatal exome, were any of them suspected clinically to have the, the disorder that ended up becoming the, the, you know, the gene finding that they found down the line? Yeah, that's a good question. There were, um, I would have to look at the details exactly, but there were a couple that um, had that condition in the, um, in the differential. So there were a couple that it was within the differential, um, but I think um, there were multiple things in the differential, and because they present so early, um, they're not able to develop a lot of the other symptoms, so the symptoms could be nonspecific. So I think for those cases, um, exon was probably the best uh, option because of some of those nonspecific findings that could fit with several different um, types of diagnoses. Obviously, we can't speak for all labs, but at Ambry, the question was, um, is reanalysis performed free of charge years down the road? Good question. Um, currently, like Steph said, speaking for Ambry, we're, we offer reanalysis um, within two years after the date of the, um, the report was issued. So if the report was issued in like 2014, we, would, um, we could offer reanalysis up until 2016. And we often recommend to wait at least a year before reanalysis. Um, that's just because some of these databases like HGMD and things may take a few months to be updated with any new literature. So we say, you know, within the one to two year time frame um, would probably be the best, best time for reanalysis. Um, at no cost. Um, how do you deal with incidental findings? Uh, great question. Uh, we offer the ACMG minimum list of the 56 genes um, at no cost. That's uh, standard with all of our tests. Um, all patients have an option to opt out. Um, we have also an expanded secondary findings list that's at an additional cost. Um, that information can, um, for, uh, for us, could be find, found on the website. Um, but um, I believe um, a lot of laboratories do at least do the ACMG minimum list, but just speaking for our own laboratory, that's what we offer with our tests. Um, and additionally, um, we don't offer any um, secondary findings for any deceased patients. And we only report out um, secondary findings for the proband only. Thank you. I just want to make a comment. Um, to heal, uh, Layla had mentioned something about um, a Kennedy Krieger paper. Um, it's actually Srivastava et al. It just came out, I think, this week or last week. It's very, very new. And it's called Clinical Whole Exome Sequencing and Child Neurology Practice. Um, and it was published in the Annals of Neurology. So if you're interested in looking at that data, um, it's fresh, hot off the press, and really, really fascinating. Um, one more question, uh, Tehila, this probably is for you. Uh, when you practiced in the NICU, did your team know what exome sequencing was, and did they ever order it? Good question. Um, so for us, no, we didn't order it. And I think that recently, um, it, it, like I said before, it is being ordered uh, more frequently. But I think this is why I feel as strongly as I do about a genetic counselors having a role in the NICU. Uh, because I think that it's, it's a population that's being missed. And there's a lot of opportunity for education and outreach for, for the physicians, for the providers, the nurses, and even the families. Great. Um, we are at 12 of 7. If there are any other questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A. Um, otherwise, that looks like we've covered everybody's questions. Um, I'll give a moment to see if there are any last minute ones. Okay. Well, thank you again for taking the time to, um, to be with us today. If you have any questions specifically for either Tahila or Layla, please feel free to email them. 
Um, we look forward to future webinars coming up and for seeing a lot of you at NSGC next week. And have a wonderful day.